Good morning, all. Welcome to my Friday uh, live show. Uh, sometimes the show is live and sometimes it's uh, pre-recorded, uh, highly ed edited uh, type video. Um, today we're live. Okay, my name is Dr. Pete. I'm a PhD biochemist and a nutrition network coach practitioner. And the subject of today's uh, presentation uh, is hyperuricemia and uh, which is which means high uric acid chronic high uric acid uh, and whether or not uh, one should consider allopurinol now i am uh, allopurinol meaning that this is a urate lowering drug and i'm aware that there are other urate lowering drugs out there um, basically this presentation uh, the idea of it is to present you with more evidence uh, about the situation that can occur in hyperuricemia so that you can make a better decision about uh, or in regard to whether or not you want to take a urate lowering uh, drug. And um, first and foremost, this presentation goes out to gout sufferers. And, uh, and I will, as we go along, uh, lead to uh, how we differentiate first dealing with, with the situation of the gout and then dealing with the hyperuricemia that may remain. I think it's important if we're going to do that um, to review the situation with gout and hyperuricemia and then talk about uh, the, the various solutions. Remember, I'm not a medical doctor. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about things that I've done to put my own gout in remission and then deal with the hyperuricemia. This is not medical advice to you. This is just information that you can use in a consultation with your doctor to try and decide what the pathway, best pathway is uh, for you. So let's go ahead and begin. Oh, and for, before I forget, um, you can put questions in the chat and I will address those uh, at the end of the presentation. And additionally, in the show notes, I have included links to various supplements uh, to my website, um, to our uh, support groups, and so on. And I would love it if you would join our free support groups um, where you can ask questions, you can interact with a uh, peer uh, group, so you can see what other people are doing to put their gout in remission um, and to reverse other chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so on. All right, so let's begin. So we're going to be talking about the issue of hyperuricemia, which means chronic high um, uric acid. And at the end of it, we're, we will address the question of, should I be on a urate lowering drug or not? And this is a topic that we've discussed on my channel a lot um, because it's a very pressing issue. So let's go through the statistics. About 9 million people uh, worldwide uh, well, excuse me, 9 million people in the U.S. present with gout. Of, of, of the population that presents with gout, we have somewhere between 43 to about 48 million people that are hyperuricemic. And not all of those people are presenting with gout. Only a fraction of them actually have uh, a gout flare. However, if you are hyperuricemic and also you're older, like I am, I'm, I'm in my 60s, the probability that you will have a gout flare because you're hyperuricemic uh, is increased. Um, the mean concentration of uric acid, and it's important to talk about this during a gout flare, is about 8.3 mg per deciliter. And when I had my gout flare in 2016, my uric acid was 8.1 mg per deciliter. It's important to talk about this mean concentration of uric acid because when we're in consultations with medical doctors, they talk about high uric acid in association with gout flares. But it's important to recognize that when they're talking about that, that the actual concentration of uric acid is usually at the top of the reference range. And the reference range 
So when you're looking at your laboratories, right, and they measure uric acid, the reference range goes between four mg per deciliter and eight mg per deciliter. So most gout flares are happening at the top of the norm, what they consider the normal range. About 18% of gout flares happen within the normal range between six and eight. And there's, there's even a large percentage, 14%, of the gout flares where the, the uric acid happens under six mix per deciliter, well within the normal range. Uh, I have had a gout flare without going off on a tangent at four mix per deciliter. So what's my point? My point is that we don't understand, and I'm gonna go through briefly the gout, my gout hypothesis. We don't understand exactly what the function of uric acid is in a gout flare. The current medical hypothesis is that we have hyperuricemia in an individual. That, that individual therefore has high uric acid. That uric acid can move into the synovial fluid or the fluid that you have in the joint that is surrounding the cartilage, is surrounding other biological cells, including residential cells of, of the uh, innate immune system. The uric acid diffuses from the circulatory system into the joint where it crystallizes and causes the gout flare. So the first thing is when we look at the statistical data, we can see that there's a problem with that hypothesis because just the simple crystallization of uric acid is while it's required for a gout flare, it's not sufficient. There has to be other factors. And, and in today's topic, we are going to talk about a, a new type of imaging, which is called dual energy computational tomography. Yeah, I know that was a mouthful. It, the acronym for this is DECT. And the importance of this uh, particular type of imaging is that it can be used to look for crystallized uric acid throughout our body. In addition to the fact that when uh, people have their synovial fluid, so again, the fluid that is bathing the cart cartilage, um, the biological cell, the chondrocyte, and the innate immune system that are in the joint, you can find crystals in individuals that are hyperuricemic and yet do not have gout flares. So this is an important finding because what it suggests is that the crystallized uric acid is not enough to cause a gout flare. There has to be other factors, and I will be addressing that. Now, uh, this information is super important to those of us that are hyperuricemic whether you've had a gout flare or not, right? Remember that there are millions of people out there that have high uric acid, but don't have gout flares. So we need to talk about the fact that there are a number of comorbidities that go along with people that are suffering from gout and go along with people that are hyperuricemic, high uric acid, but don't suffer from gout. So it's important to recognize that about three quarters of the individuals that suffer from gout are also uh, going to be suffering from high blood pressure. That's what the hypertension is. And we see that if you're hyperuricemic, that about half of those individuals also are suffering from high blood pressure. We see that a substantial number of both groups, the gout sufferers and the people that are suffering from hyperuricemia uh, are in some stage of chronic kidney disease. And this is most likely because of the damage that happens in the proximal tubules of the kidney that are functioning in uh, uh, monosodium urate reabsorption, the reabsorption of uric acid that's being transported to the kidneys by the circulatory system, along with other fundamental um, functions of that area of the kidney, including glucose homeostasis. We see that about half the people that suffer from gout and half the people that are suffering from hyperuricemia um, are obese. A significant portion of those individuals 
are type 2 diabetics, we see about 14% of the hyperuricemic individuals, high uric acid individuals, but no gout, 14% type 2 diabetics. There's comorbidities here. And I'm going to be talking about that relationship when, when we get to the central driving mechanism that, that uh, where there's substantial evidence, both in animal studies and in human clinical studies, that's driving these conditions, the high, the high uric acid and, and the condition of gout. And we see that there's a substantial cardiovascular disease risk, both for gout patients and for people that have high uric acid. And we will be addressing that issue today as well as we move into this, uh, as we start describing the issue that, that can exist for people that are hyperuricemic and suffer from gout. So sitting underneath all of this, the driving, uh, the main driver of, of, in my opinion, of gout, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, the hyperuricemic state, and so on, is fructose metabolism. And we need to review this right now before we talk about anything else. We have basically three contributing factors to activating the fructose pathway. First, let's define how the fructose pathway works. So in the presence of fructose, which would be coming in, the, the easiest scenario to understand here is the fructose that's coming in via the ingestion of sugar or added sugars uh, in a diet uh, that involves either eating the sugar directly if it's an added sugar, it's most likely coming in through processed food. And uh, that food is going to enter through the digestive system and arrive at the liver in the portal vein. The fructose is going to move into the liver in an unregulated manner. And then, as you can see in this diagram, the, the vast majority of the fructose, in fact, all of it, is going to be converted into fructose 1-phosphate by an enzyme called fructokinase. The main take home here is the following three things. Firstly, the ATP supply in the liver and then any other tissue where we have fructose metabolism going on. So that's going to include brain, adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, intestinal uh, tissues, um, kidney, and also liver. And the liver is the model system where, that we're talking about to describe this. So in the process, of this uh, uh, first step driving the fructose to fructose 1-phosphate, the enzyme fructokinase, we're going to have the ATP supply in the liver is going to be decimated. At the same time, we're going to see decimation of the phosphate supply. So we're not getting recycling here of energy. We're not, uh, we're not producing ATP. In fact, the fructose metabolism is, has a storage function in humans that I will come back to in a second. So we have this decimation of the ATP supply. We have decimation of the phosphate supply with a sudden acute rise in uric acid, which is a signaling molecule that causes uh, an increase in systemic inflammation with uh, pinnacle proteins, junk one, IL-1 beta, and other kinds of transcription factors that are uh, important for the regulation and the driving force between the in inflammational for the inflammational cascade. We have mitochondrial dysfunction. So the, the burning function of the mitochondria, the burning of uh, fatty acids is shut off. We have uh, the activation of de novo lipogenesis, meaning the synthesis of new fat in the liver. So we have the burning function is turned off. The, the mitochondria is ramped down in terms of burning and producing ATP. That function is turned off. We have de novo lipogenesis. It's turned on. So the production of new fat in the liver that results in the formation of oil droplets in the liver, thinking down the road, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then those 
those triglycerides are released or packaged into VLDLs, which then get circulated or around the body to other tissues. We have the downregulation of the nitric oxide pathway. So in endothelial cells, this means that we're going to disrupt the normal function of nitric oxide. So the normal uh, rhythm of vasodilation and vasoconstriction as one of the things that gets downregulated. Uh, and th that would be the most important aspects of this to talk about. Now, what are, I said there are three factors that are tied into this pathway. What are the, what are the other two? So we, we have both alcohol and hyperglycemia that contribute to fructose metabolism. And the way that they do this is through activation of another pathway called polyol, which is two biochemical steps. The alcohol activates the first enzyme in that process, which is called aldose reductase. And if we have a hyperglycemic meal happening at the same time that we have the added sugars coming in, and somebody's also drinking alcohol in that meal, then about 30% of the glucose that's coming into the liver is going to be pushed into fructose by the polyol pathway. And then that fructose is going to be converted to fructose 1-phosphate. We call the fructose that's being produced this way via the polyol pathway, the production of endogenous fructose. So we have somebody eating the standard American meal, the standard American diet, where they're eating five or six times a day, where, where the majority of those meals are hyperglycemic and also with significant added sugars in it. So we have activation of polyol pathway plus the, in, the introduction of the fructose directly so that we're producing the, the fructose 1-phosphate and we see again the decline in the ATP and the phosphate with the sudden acute rise in uric acid. And then during the evening meal, a lot of adults are adding in uh, the additional factor of the alcohol. So that's how this pathway is operating to produce the dysfunction. And remember that we have this going on any, in any sort of uh, tissue that has uh, fructose metabolism available to it. And I listed off those functions a minute ago or those tissues or organs a minute ago. So. If we talk about gout for a minute, my hypothesis is as follows. If that, it, that it tends to explain the data much better than the idea that we have hy a hyperuricemic situation, the uric acid diffuses into the joint, crystallizes, and like having a sliver in, the fig in, in a finger causes this inflammation. So let's just talk about the, the condition in the joint. So we have this biologically important cell called the chondrocyte, whose function it is to maintain the integrity of the joint, to maintain the health of the cartilage, to provide the various kinds of, of large molecules that are needed for that, for, for the function of the joint, so that you can do things with your fingers, your legs, you can walk, all that stuff, and you can do it. Um, easily because the joints are, are well lubricated and there's, you know, there's no pain or, or, or anything that's causing the joint not to function. We have the presence of the innate immune system. And there is a, a wealth of osteoarthritic literature that shows under conditions of, of hyperglycemia that the chondrocyte is under the pressure of low-grade inflammation. There's also some data in the literature that would indicate that the polyol pathway in the chondrocyte is active. And so the, the only hole in this is an answer to a black and white question. Is there fructose metabolism in the chondrocyte? We don't know the answer to that yet, but I believe that you have a situation where the chondrocytes are under the pressure of low-grade infl inflammation. We have some high level or reasonably high level of uric acid that's being produced chronically because of the hyperglycemia due to the standard American diet. There, um, there could also be inflammation in, in the joint because of, of uh, physical destruction 
you know, somebody who's an athlete like myself with my fingers and the rock climbing I've done for over 50 years. Um, so the, some physical damage that, that is in the joint that contributes to uh, uh, an inflammational uh, environment there. We have uh, basically the chondrocyte is primed uh, because of the poly L pathway so that we have some basal level of uric acid that's being produced above a level where it should be pushing uh, the systemic inflammation, the downregulation of nitric oxide pathways and so on. We have um, under those conditions, we have uh, IL-1 beta that is being produced uh, under, under a, a meal where we have all three major factors, the alcohol, the hyperglycemia and fructose coming into this. Then we can take that primed chondrocyte and we can push it over the edge so that it literally is sickened to the point of perhaps even cellular death. And under those conditions, uh, the uric acid that is intracellular is going to be pushed out into the fluid that is surrounding that cell, along with IL-1 beta that recruits the innate immune system that includes macrophages, neutrophils, and monocytes, which are also capable through this signaling of elevating the inflammational process uh, so that we have activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome along with actually other inflammasomes. The data shows this. There can be other effector molecules like extracellular ATP and also um, some fatty acids like steric acid. There's data that shows that can activate these inflammasomes along with um, the uh, monosodium urate that is there. And when we have all these things that come together, bam, we get um, the gout flare. This is basically in a nutshell, as a, as a review, this is what I think is going on with, with the gout flares. So this brings us to, all right, how do we get gout remission? And uh, and I talked about this last week. So first and foremost, we need to, to stop with the deadly triad. And what do I mean by that? I mean, elimination of alcohol, um, stop eating meals that are hyperglycemic. So that means that we want to be sensitive to the, the types of sugars and carbs that we're eating. We want to stay away from the high glycemic foods, right? Like, Eating a, eating bananas and oatmeal and other other food fruits that are loaded into an oatmeal meal, for example, with honey added in on top of that, that would be a no. All right, and um, and the reduction of added sugars in um, not eating processed foods. So we get rid of that stuff. All right, we stabilize our metabolism. Now, for those people that are suffering from other comorbidities, and you might ask the question, well, how are you going to know about, uh, what those are? Because, you know, in a gout situation, when I first went to the doctor in 2016, the only thing that they did besides take an x-ray was to measure my level of uric acid. There was no discussion at all about the fact that gout is what I call a pinnacle consequence of this central driving factor that is causing the diabetes, the obesity, and the cardiovascular disease. That would be at the core of it, fructose metabolism, along with other issues surrounding hyperglycemia. So I didn't know at the time that if, if the doctor had looked at other biomarkers, that we, they, we might have been able to catch the prediabetes earlier than it was for me, which didn't happen until three years later. So here's the thing. I think it's really important if you know you're a gout sufferer to, to do the due diligence and have extensive blood work done to determine whether or not you're at risk for these other comorbidities. Because if you're diabetic or if you're a cardiovascular disease, there's plenty of data out there now that shows that Besides getting rid of the alcohol, the hyperglycemia, and the incoming fructose, if you cut into the carbs, you lower the, car the carbs adequately that you can reverse these other chronic diseases. 
So uh, what I recommend is that you first stabilize the metabolism. We're talking about three meals a day. It's essentially low carb because you've cut out all this other stuff, right? Uh, which is going to make that uh, whole real food diet. You're buying real food, you're cutting it up and you're cooking it, right? You do this for a while. Then if need be, you cut into the carbs. And then upon keto adaption, this usually takes two to three months, um, with biomarker monitoring, then you, you start asking questions about where the uricemia is. What is your uric acid looking like at that point? Because in my experience with the people that I coach and also the people that communicate with me back and forth on uh, Dr. Pete's Keto Club, the YouTube channel, it seems that people sort of break into two groups. There is the group that once they reach keto adaption, seem to have their uric acid move into the normal range between four and eight, while there's others like me who tend to settle out at the top of the range. And it's at that point you want to make the decision uh, because at the top of the range uh, for women, value six or greater, um, men seven or greater is considered hyperuricemic. And that's the topic today. And now let's get, let's actually move into that issue to make the decision at that point. Do I go on a urate lowering drug or not? What is the information I need for this? So the first thing as we, as we get into this, and I, I can see from my time, I'm already been going a while, but here's the thing. How do you decide about the hyperuricemia? And uh, there's plenty of arguments out there about the uh, antioxidant effect. And I'm not really going to address that today. But what I will say about that before we dive into DECT, dual energy computed tomography, is that uh, what the, some of the top experts in the world think about this, like Dr. Richard Johnson and Perlmutter, is that the amount of antioxidant effect we need by the uric acid is significantly lower than what we see in hyperuricemic uh, individuals. And as an expert in this area myself, I feel the same way. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is this concept that, or it's actually uh, an experimental result that is shown that monosodium urate, or in layman's terms, uric acid appears to be crystallized throughout our body in individuals that are hyperuricemic. And I think this data, even though it's associational, right, not causative, but associational, I think this is the data that pushed me over the edge where I said, yeah, okay, I am going to, to um, take a, a urate lowering drug, and I'm going to look for supplements that will enhance the effects of that particular drug because I want my uricemia to be significantly lower than it is or was at the point of keto adaption. So it starts with this. Um, this this is an imaging technique that's super important to us. It it the basis of this. Uh, is involved in coronary uh, um, uh, art, art, uh, ath atherosclerotic uh, calcium scores. It's a technique that, that allows, uh, when this data comes in using sophisticated software, to also answer the question, besides seeing calcium uh, located in a plaque, can we also see uric acid there? So let's take a look at uh, some of the data. And here you're looking at this imaging technique where they where they looked at the uh, uh, coronary uh, atherosclerotic uh, calcium scores or, or the imaging for that uh, in, in the aorta of individuals. And uh, the panel underneath you can see in green shows the presence of, of monosodium urate or uric acid that is also in the plaque. So, so again, 
I, we're talking about an association here. So people that are suffering from cardiovascular disease, for example, uh, you can find these plaques for, uh, in their in their system, and you can also find uric acid associated with those plaques. Does that mean that the plaque is actually causing the cardiovascular disease? And this is a question that is actually highly controversial right now. Um, we have this association. Um, does that mean that the plaque is causing the, the cardiovascular disease or was it a question that something else was going on that was causing the disease and this is a response by our body? That's an open question. I don't know the answer to it. The thing, the thing that's important to recognize here is that we're finding uric acid uh, in the plaques, in the same plaques where we find uh, the calcified um, plaques. If we summarize the results from the paper that, that I showed you guys uh, two slides ago, you can break their patients into two groups. There's 59 gout sufferers, average age 59 years. Uh, 86% of them had cardiovascular monosodium urate deposited uh, in the linings of their cardiovascular disease. And we had 32% of those individuals had uric acid in their plaques. That's the coronary MSU. The average CAC score for those guys, the 59 patients was 900. And in the patients that had the uh, calcium or the coronary artery uh, calcium score or uh, the plaques with MSU, their CAC score was 950. And it's worth talking about the fact that the, the average uric acid at the time of the imaging was six point, approximately 6.4 mg per deciliter. So near the upper end of what's considered normal for you know, a uric acid range. And then there were 47 non-gout patients that, that were um, in the study. And the average age was 70 years old. They were significantly by at least a decade older. 15% of those individuals had uric acid crystals in their cardiovascular system. So, so again, this is important. It's important to the hyperuricemia people because not everyone who suffers from hyperuricemia, asymm uh, are, not everyone that suffers from high uric acid is also a gout sufferer, right? There are many people in that group, high uric acid that don't suffer from gout, but we find crystallized monosodium urate in their cardiovascular system. So this, this should be a concern to those of us that are hyperuricemic. We've, we've put our gout in remission. Right now we're hyperuricemic with no gout symptoms. And the issue is, do we need to worry about crystallized uric acid in other places besides our big toe or besides a knee or besides a, a finger, right? That's, that's the situation. And for hyperuricemic people that are out there that have never had gout, this is, a, this is an issue. And we see that 4% of the non-gout hyperuricemic people uh, had crystal, crystals in their coronary system. Uh, their average CAC, 263, not incredibly high compared to 900. And interestingly, their uricemia was slightly higher than the, than the gout sufferers at the time of the analysis. Now, let's take a look at uh, a different review that takes into consideration not just the DECT, not just the dual energy computational tomography. Don't ask me why the scientists gotta give such complicated names to things. This was a, a systemic review that was done and published in 2020. And the cool thing about this study, and remember, this is associational stuff. So I'm not saying that crystalline uric acid in your coronary system is what's causing your cardiovascular disease. But I'm fairly alarmed that it's there in the plaque, along with everything else in individuals do, that are suffering. And what's more, it's worrisome about the fact that that crystallized uric acid is also in the people that suffer from hyperuricemia with no gout symptoms. So what's important about this 2020 review, they did a systemic review. They looked at over uh, 290 publications and they looked specifically 
for the evidence of crystallized monosodium urate throughout the body in different locations. Uh, and here are the types of studies that they found. Clinical exams, uh, evidence through surgery, autopsies of people that had already passed away, DECT imaging, uh, histopathology, where you take a sample of something, right? And then you stain it, whatever, you do other things to it. Then you use light microscopy to identify uh, monosodium urate crystals. So let's see what they found. And this is the shocking thing. This is the data that made me sit back and go, all right, I think it's probably a good idea after keto adaption, I was keto adapted a year into it uh, before I, I uh, in fact, it was even a longer time period where I stabilized my metabolism. And then when I saw this data, I was like, all right, you know what? I think it's a good idea to get my uric acid below seven. So here's, let's take a look at this. Oh, this is just an example of, of uh, the wide variety of techniques that they use. So they use, uh, other standard imaging techniques to, to look for um, um, the presence of monosodium urate in biological structures. You can see the top there. I put a big fatty red arrow showing the presence of uric acid in the valve in a heart, the mitral valve, right? Below that, you have uh, uh, light microscopy that was used to, to, to identify uh, monosodium urate and other structures. And then down below, you see some, some more DECT, D-E-C-T. Uh, the green color being uric acid. And this is, uh, again, in the coronary system of a patient. As an example, so you can see the wide variety of studies that were analyzed. Oh, and this is a really interesting one because in this case, you have individuals that were going to the doctor uh, who had been past gout sufferers and were complaining about back pain. And lo and behold, you can see this on the, on the panel below uh, the duct uh, imaging here where, where there are uh, uric, uric acid monosodium urate depositions right in the spine. And uh, in, in many of these cases, it's possible that uh, urate lowering drugs regimes would have taken care of this problem rather than these people actually going under the under the knife and having surgery uh, in cases where they weren't aware that the back pain was most likely being driven by the presence of these crystals in their spinal uh, system so now if we if we look at the review there was a total of uh, 290 studies. And uh, when we, uh, uh, there were 113 studies that showed the presence of monosodium urate in the spinal system. Uh, skin, uh, they're showing up in the skin. And then look, look at the results from uh, eyes. I mean, this is shocking. 36 studies where uh, monosodium urate was shown uh, in their eyes, right? Different different structures within the ocular system, uh, the renal system, right? There's there's a number of papers that have actually um, started to address causally the movement of uric acid from the circulatory system into the kidney, it, specifically into the proximal tubule cells, where the incoming uric acid through its transporter system into the proximal tubule systems can elicit or drive all the same effects as, as uric acid that's being produced directly by fructose metabolism. That is worrisome because what it suggests is that hyperuricemia uh, can be driving these intracellular processes, right? The intracellular dysfunction of the organ by moving down a concentration gradient coming in from the circulatory system, there's actual data for this for the kidney. And I saw a study this morning that looked at human, a human tissue culture uh, line 
relative to endothelial cells. And granted, one or two studies is not enough, especially on in on an in vitro level to say, okay, this could be contributing to cardiovascular disease. Because remember, the, the cellular lining of our cardiovascular system, our arteries, it are endothelial cells, right? And in vitro, we have this same uh, functionality where external uh, or exogenous uric acid can move into the endothelial cell and then cause this dysfunction. So when we boil this down, for those of us that are hyperuricemic, this is the question. Is the uric acid at this high level that that's, has the capability to move into cells causing dysfunction that we need to worry about. The, the cardiovascular disease, uh, the kidney dysfunction that, that downstream can lead to, to uh, chronic kidney disease, which literally in the end can kill us, right? Um, the cardiovascular disease can kill us. So this is the question that needs to be answered. I'm not saying that I've answered it here, but I think that this data on the crystallization issue is the thing that drove me over the edge. It, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I said, you know what? I'm going to decrease my hyperuricemia down well within the normal range. I'm going to do that. It was a personal choice. This is not medical advice. But I think that understanding the crystalline nature of the monosodium urate throughout the body, I mean, look at this even in the bowel, the, the breast, pancreas, uh, pulmonary. Uh, li- there's uh, there's evidence for this happening in the liver, right? And we use the liver model system where we know that we can have significantly high levels of of intracellular uric acid being produced there. And and I would think at some point, at s- beyond some threshold in the liver, that that you you can have crystallization right there. And if you do, it's not a stretch. To, to think about, all right, what are these infl- inflammasomes? We know that IL-1 beta is elevated in the liver when we have the substantial rise in uric acid and IL-1 beta can drive inflammasome driven inflammation, right? Um, so this is what the data looks like. So the recommendation uh, by the the guys who study this stuff, the medical establishment that focus on this is to get your uric acid under six and you can decide what you want to do. If you follow Perlmutter and you follow Johnson, they talk about this too. They talk about um, using urate lowering systems in order to get your uric acid down to around five. And currently I run mine uh, based on biomarker monitoring, I had finger stick for uric acid. I'm, I run mine between four and five. So I test my fasting uric acid every day. Um, and I'm abiding by this um, recommendation. This is just to t- show you again. I, I talked about this last week. This is what my typical day looks like. I, I eat because I'm keto adapted. I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, I'm only eating two meals a day. As I say that, I'm not telling you, okay, when you go keto, you're only going to have to, you're only eating two meals a day. No, I'm keto adapted. And there was a natural transition here through the natural satiety properties of that lifestyle. And now I'm eating about two meals a day. It depends on what my activity level was for for the day. I'm a CrossFit athlete. I'm a rock climber. So I am I'm doing something almost every single day of the week. And on days where I do something really hard, right, I push for many hours and I do something hard, sometimes I'll have a third meal. In any case, for my morning meal, I take 100 milligrams. Oh, I see there was a typo in this slide. It's not 100 grams, it's 100 milligrams. Sorry about the typo. And I'm doing about 500 uh, milligrams of kerosene. And then at my evening meal, I'm doing 100 milligrams of the all pure and all again, along with uh, uh, the kerosene. And I'm maintaining my uric acid between four and five uh, 
that's my trend uh, day in, day out. Again, there's a typo on this slide. I'm doing 100 milligrams of all purinol, purinol not, uh, not 100 grams, twice a day. Uh, and this is just to reiterate, uh, this is an example of the cure seton uh, that I take. This is not an advertisement for these guys. I'm really serious about this stuff. I'm not going to recommend supplements to you that I haven't tested on myself and saw an effect. So yes, I've tested this brand. It works to bring my uric acid down. Next to it is uh, the literature citation that shows that cure seton has an effect. Um, this is the tart cherry that I do. Again, uh, I've tested it. I see an effect. Um, you know, uh, again, sorting out dose is a personal thing. Uh, you have to do the testing. This is not medical advice. This is what I do. Um, what you do is, you know, you have to sort that out. Maybe it's a discussion with your doctor. Um, and then finally, last week, I talked about CoQ10, but in the in the, the time between my two sessions, I discovered this citation that shows that this is an antioxidant. Also, it um, increases the robustness of the mitochondria and other things that you can do supplemental to help the mitochondria. This is one of the few where I've actually found literature evidence that it actually gets to its site of action, right? That's the thing about supplements. If you take them, are they actually getting to where they're supposed to go, and are they doing what they should? And I have felt, um, um, this is anecdotal, I have felt an increase uh, in how I feel after a workout. Like, uh, what I mean is it's cut my, my recovery time literally in half since I started using this, and now I have a citation that actually shows that it also can contribute to urate lowering. Um, and this is something that I sense, but it's not something that I've shown in myself directly by limiting the other supplements and just doing this one. I haven't done that. So you can take, you can, you should take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, this is what I do for myself. It's not medical advice. All right. And with that, I'm going to finish. Um, let me check, uh, quickly check my chat and see if, if there are questions here uh, that I, I can address before I go. Okay, I, I want everyone to see this uh, comment. Uh, this, this is uh, somebody who follows me. Uh, and as they say right here, they're carnivore. Um, their uh, uric acid has mainly been under six. That's really awesome, man. Congratul uh, all I can say is congratulations. Because you know what? This business is hard. It really is. Lifestyle change is hard. And we can all do it if we want to. Being systematic, careful, and going along meticulously having the care of a doctor using making intelligent decisions you can have success and look at this guy right now his blood glucose 89 um, beta hydroxybutyrate coming in at 2.6 uric, uric acid 6.1 a1c uh, below five up i mean i don't know what more do you want right congratulations uh pete you're doing really really excellent thanks for the support by the way um I'm going to be closing out if there is, uh, or if there's any other questions, put them in the chat now, or if you're shy, you can also put them on the YouTube channel. I'll address them there. Okay, so I don't see uh, any other questions here. Remember, I have um, supplement links in my show notes. Uh, also, you, where you can find me, my email address, our website. I have a products page there too. Anyway, you guys have a really good day and I will see you um, next week.